Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your Archbishop of Banterbury, your Sommelier of Cinema, your Chancellor of Cheerfulness, and lest we forget, maybe my favorite, what I don't, I still don't know what it means, your Existential Mr. Rogers, Robert Meyer Burnett, and I am robcasting at you from this the Observatory today with a very special episode of Rob observations one I've wanted to do for a while now before I begin I would like to say that uh, I would like to think this episode is being done in tandem with the inglorious Trexperts podcast if you have never listened to the inglorious Trexperts podcast well then you're not a Star Trek fan but the Inglorious Trexperts are Mark Altman and Darren Doctorman. Of course, I work with Mark Altman on Free Enterprise, who he is currently in Bulgaria producing season two of Pandora. Darren Doctorman has worked on more movies than you can possibly imagine. Everything from, well, back in the day, The Abyss, Exorcist 3, all the way up through the recent season of West, uh, Westworld. Uh, he's been a production illustrator and designer for motion pictures for over 30 years. And the two of them are the Inglorious Trexperts, and they frequently have guests such as myself and Ashley Edward Miller, who is the co-writer, of course, of Agent Cody Banks, Thor, X-Men First Class. He was a producer on Black Sails. I mean, he's worked on, well, many credits. And then there's me. And we do uh, many different shows. I I've been a frequent guest uh, on the Inglorious Trexperts podcast. Well, today, the Inglorious Trexperts dropped a very interesting show that the four of us appear on. And it is an interview with screenwriter and producer Eric Jedrinson. Eric Jedrinson was one of the supervising producers of HBO's Band of Brothers. And he certainly has a very interesting story to tell. So, this episode of Rob's Observations is meant to be experienced in tandem with today's episode of the Inglorious Trexperts, which is available wherever podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from, you can get them everywhere. But what it's about is a very interesting chapter of Star Trek that never really was, which in my mind is ironic, because if this particular project had happened, it would have satisfied, in my mind, it would have satisfied everything that Paramount was seeking to achieve with what they tried to do with the Kelvin universe and J.J. Abrams, which, uh, for various reasons, I don't think they were successful at doing. And also, anything that I think has been attempted by Secret Hideout over the last three years, and in my mind has failed miserably at, uh, would have been alleviated by something from Star Trek's past that never happened. And it's, uh, it's a very interesting story. Star Trek has a number of interesting tales of things that didn't occur. Uh, many people might have heard the stories of Philip Kaufman's never-to-be-made Planet of the Titans film when Toshiro Mifune might have been playing a Klingon. This was something that was going to be done in the mid-70s. And the actual original design of the Starship Discovery is sort of the... Um, the grandson or granddaughter or grand person or grand being of the enterprise that was designed underneath Ken Adam by Ralph McQuarrie, which is sort of interesting. So all of Star Trek's never made things seem to figure out or, or worm their way into actual Star Trek. After Planet of the Titans went nowhere, the Star Trek Phase Two television series was developed in the 70s. And this was pre-Star Trek The Motion Picture. And they were going to make a new Star Trek series, a new five-year mission, where they were, going to, they were going to introduce Decker and Ilea. And Leonard Nimoy was not going to be in it. Famously, there was going to be Lieutenant Zahn, another Vulcan. And there were 13 scripts commissioned for the Star Trek Phase Two television series. Now, it was never made. It was then turned into Star Trek The Motion Picture. But two of those scripts were eventually made for Star Trek The Next Generation. The first episode of the second season of TNG, The Child, John Povel's uh, The Child, was uh, made for TNG. It was originally written for Star Trek Phase Two, And John Povel actually directed another version of it for the Star Trek New Voyages fan film series that was produced what in, in what is now the 
official Star Trek museum, the recreation, James Colley's recreation of the Enterprise Bridge in Ticonderoga. Then in the fourth season of Next Gen, there was another script that was originally commissioned for Phase 2 called Devil's Do that was actually made. So things have a way of coming, coming around. Well, interestingly, interestingly enough, what we're going to talk about today, what I'm going to cover today, is Star Trek The Beginning. Now, the title was just a working title, and it really isn't about Star Trek The Beginning. And I remember when I first heard about this, it sounded to me like it was this militarized version of Star Trek. It didn't sound very appealing, but I hadn't read it. You know, I just heard basic sketches of, of what had happened. Well, again, on today's Inglorious Trexperts podcast, you can hear screenwriter and producer Eric Jedrinson from The Horse's Mouth tell the story of how he became involved with Star Trek The Beginning. I'm going to give you a sort of a, a nutshell version of it. So this happened very soon after Star Trek Enterprise went off the air in 2005. Eric Jedrinson was actively courted by the top brass at Paramount at that time, Donald DeLine and Kerry McCluggage. Now, they were running the studio. They were above Rick Berman. Rick Berman was not really a part of this uh, at the time. They were going after him. And here's the funny thing. <laughs> Eric Jedrinson didn't ever watch Star Trek. He wasn't particularly a fan of science fiction. He had absolutely no interest in doing anything Star Trek related for Paramount. But they, he was like Cameron in uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, another Paramount film. They kept calling him, they kept calling him. And finally he relented and he said, okay. Now, he didn't know anything about Star Trek and I would say that he was in a similar position of Nicholas Meyer when Nicholas Meyer came on board Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. Nicholas Meyer was unfamiliar with Star Trek, but because Star Trek is based in literary tradition, beginning with things like Horatio Hornblower, if you're a smart literary person, it's not really that difficult to understand sort of the, the foundational underpinnings of what Star Trek is all about, and indeed, how to tell a great Star Trek story. So Eric Jedrinson did what anybody who should be writing in Star Trek would do. He dove in. He immersed himself into Star Trek lore. He watched everything. He made copious notes. Because what he wanted to do is he realized that, well, it's all laid out for me. It's all here. So what he was tasked with doing was coming up with something new. Something that the studio could use. They wanted to turn it into a film series. They wanted it to be action filled with action adventure, filled with new characters young characters, um, and everything a studio would want from a, 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 uh, a new Star Trek movie. But what, what Eric Jedrinson did was he decided, in his infinite wisdom, he said, you know, where Enterprise leaves off with the founding of the Federation is exactly where you could begin a new Star Trek story. And the one thing that fascinated him, obviously, coming from a band of brothers, conflict, wartime, the Romulan War, which was something that Star Trek was leading up to, Star Trek Enterprise was leading up to, but never got there. The Romulans uh, frequently showed up in Enterprise, and no one, of course, had seen them. They hadn't really delved into the Romulan backstory. But Eric Jedrinson was like, uh, here we go. In his mind, he was going to write a trilogy of films that was going to detail the Romulan War and detail a whole new cast of characters. New young people creating new Starfleet officers, presumably new alien uh, officers, some familiar, some new. And most of all, what he eventually wrote had incredible canonical fealty it actually touched on elements from all of the different star trek series i mean it was heavily weighted toward enterprise because that's what had happened but there are references to next generations episodes like the first duty uh it's amazing uh what he was able to do in a script 
Now, he finished a first draft of Star Trek The Beginning. It was dated August 22nd, 2005. Soon after he turned it in, the studio brass at Paramount, Donald DeLine, well, Carrie McCluggage, Donald DeLine was out. And what happens frequently at motion picture studios is when there is a regime change, almost everything that the ousted regime was working on gets tossed aside. So Star Trek The Beginning was never, ever really considered by the new regime a possibility at all. It was seen as something that was commissioned before the new regime was there. So it was essentially abandoned, um, never to be considered. Now, here's the thing. In my mind, the Kelvin universe, as we all know, takes place in an alternate Star Trek universe not the real canonical Star Trek universe. So the real canonical Star Trek universe pretty much ended in 2005 with Enterprise. Now, I understand we've got Picard, we've got Star Trek Discovery, but clearly, call it a visual reboot, call it what you want, but it is clearly not canonical Star Trek. They have, there, there's been so many alterations to both timelines, to technology, to all kinds of things. It is its own thing call it what you will. But the interesting thing about what they've done with Discovery and what they've done with Picard is they decided to change, in my mind, a lot of things. Change Star Trek into something new. They're like, oh, we have to update it. You know, we have to make it more appealing to the modern ADD audience. Whatever the hell the, the, they've wanted to do. Um, clearly, they have not necessarily been as wildly successful as they could have been which makes Star Trek The Beginning all the more exciting and interesting because it does everything that they've been trying to do for the last 11 years of Star Trek, and they haven't quite made it. They haven't turned Star Trek into a water cooler show as much as they might, want to, might have wanted to. They have not done this. Interestingly enough, Star Trek The Beginning does everything that the studio has wanted to do with Star Trek, certainly what they tried to do with the Kelvinverse. But really the problem was, in my mind, you know, Star Trek has always been, up until 2005, new. Even Enterprise, it went back, it was a prequel show, but especially by the fourth season, it really showed you the forming of the foundation, uh, uh, the, the beginnings of, of the Federation, which was sort of interesting. And by the fourth season, it was really cooking with fire. And I think if they were allowed to move forward, they would have done some really interesting things, and it probably would have lasted seven seasons. And even the third season, the Zindi arc was interesting. But this script, Star Trek The Beginning, I believe would have revitalized Star Trek in the exact way that Paramount wanted to see happen with Star Trek 09, and certainly the way CBS All Access hoped that Star Trek Discovery would be and Star Trek Picard would be for the new generation. But it hasn't really worked out that way. However, that's not to say that this script couldn't be resurrected. As a matter of fact, I would say with a few tweaks, which I will suggest when I get to the end of this, with a few tweaks, this should absolutely be made as the new Star Trek theatrical feature. However, it must have canonical fealty to the timeline that ended in 2005. Because there's even characters that we will remember in this script. So what is Star Trek The Beginning actually about? What is this story? Why do I have such uh, affection for it? Why do I think it's so good? Well, I think it does a number of things really well. I think, one, it takes us back to the Star Trek universe, the Star Trek that we know and we love. It introduces us to a whole new cast of characters that we've never met before. It gives us incredible, well, canonical fealty to the things that have come before. But if you didn't know that, if you were not a Star Trek fan that was steeped in canon, you wouldn't know just how much canonical fealty this script has to what has come before, which is exciting. It also details the Romulan War, actually the outbreak of it. And in grand Star Trek fashion, it asks big philosophical questions. Philosophical questions that 
make this not just an action adventure film with action that is well the largest space battles we've certainly ever seen around earth they dwarf anything we saw in first contact and best of both worlds this is epic on a scale that we haven't seen in a star trek film and even though there would be people that are going to be like, oh, Rob, once again, you're talking about Star Trek battle, 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 war, 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 death, death, death. Yes, I am. But this is something that happened in the Star Trek universe. We know it happened. It's been referenced all the way back to the original series in the first season with Balance of Terror. And I think it works wonderfully well. That said, why don't we just jump into it and talk about what happens in this script? Star Trek The Beginnings script begins with the Paramount logo and a riff on that logo where we, um, we go past the logo to the Farallon Islands off the coast of San Francisco and we find ourselves in the middle of a giant sailing regatta. And these sailing ships are hover ships. They, they hover just feet, inches even, above the surf. And we meet people like Lieutenant Jax, a handsome young face framed by foul weather hood, eyes squinting, teeth clenched against a ferocious 40 knot wind. So we have a Lieutenant Jax and uh, very capable, interesting guy. And we meet all of our characters. They're all sailing on various boats. Then we meet uh, Nicken. And Nikon is a female character, uh, very attractive, but also tough as nails. I mean, think a any character that, uh, that you uh, can imagine, whether it's Ripley, whether it's Buffy, that kind of a tough as nails character. And then we meet Tiberius Chase. Tiberius Chase is Kirk's great-grandfather. Uh, we've heard about him, how, we, how he was named, especially uh, in Roddenberry's novelization for Star Trek The Motion Picture, and it's, uh, it's pretty great. And there's a very long opening sequence. Not long, it's the first 10 pages of the script with this exciting... It's, a, it's like the America's Cup. And you're introduced to all of our characters and uh, during this regatta. And it's very cool, it's very uh, fun... And all of these, the, 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 you're in the midst of this competition, and we meet all of our characters. There's a, a Maori character named Mr. Og, um, uh, and there's just a, a great group of, of, of exciting young people, including Tiberius Chase, who is our main character. And uh, during this, we're, we, are, we realize that this is basically the graduation of the United Earth Stellar Naval Academy, the UESN. These are cadets about to graduate. And this is, um, this is what they do. This is their big graduation ceremony is this regatta. And then we are at Starfleet headquarters. We meet uh, the characters at Starfleet headquarters. And we meet Admiral Gardner, who is the head of Starfleet. And his son uh, is one of these characters. He's graduating. Uh, from the Naval Academy, the Earth Stellar Naval Academy. And it is, it is incredible. And at this time, we see a bunch of other dignitaries from all over the place watching. This is the, the UESN class of 2159. And you've got Chase, Jax, Nicken, and Gardner Jr., the Admiral's son. Those four characters are who we are going to follow. Those are our main characters. They're the, and they are from... Uh, top wing the, the division is called top wing and as they're as they're doing this you you watch this regatta and you see admiral gardner and all these dignitaries oh they're all watching this and chase pulls out a maneuver at the end where he actually cuts one of his sails and it billows free but it's jutting out front in front of the boat so he actually wins just by he he, he just pulls it out at the last minute and uh it's a really exciting way to open this, uh, the, the, the script and you meet these characters and you realize they're good at what they're, what they do. They're, they're graduates and they're all part of the, uh, 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 
it, it feels it feels very sort of you know whether it's right stuff officer and gentleman it's like what the end of the, any one of those movies would be it this is the beginning this regatta is is, is that and uh, it's great and then you realize that what they are prepping for is they are prepping for uh, the first Beyond Warp 5 capable test flight. Now, we know from Enterprise, the Enterprise, the NX-01, uh, is a Warp 5 ship, but now they are going to attempt to break that barrier, and they've built a ship uh, to do that. And the person that thinks they're going to fly this ship is Tiberius Chase. Now, unfortunately, what Tiberius Chase finds out, and what we, well, we find out later in the script, but I'll tell you right now, is Tiberius Chase comes from his family, uh, his father especially, is a fanatical Earth first person. And if you remember from Enterprise, from uh, Demons and Terra Prime, there was a, a xenophobic group that believes that al the alien presence on Earth should be eliminated. And Tiberius Chase, his father, Otto, is one of those people. So he has sort of a checkered past. And his family was also, uh, they were sympathetic to Colonel Green. And for those of you who don't know who Colonel Green is, Colonel Green is a character that was first introduced in one of the last episodes of the original series, The Savage Curtain. And Colonel Green believed after the post-atomic horror uh, of Earth that we talked that was talked about in Star Trek: First Contact uh, that he had very brutal ways of making sure the population survived. So not a good bar, not not a good bar, not a good guy. And so that's that's where we're at with our main character. And our main character is not trusted necessarily by Starfleet, even though he's an incredible officer. And he has proven himself over and over again. Starfleet doesn't entirely trust him because of his checkered family past. Even though his family past, uh, Chase believes that that shouldn't reflect poorly on him. But it, in fact, does. So instead of flying this new test flight for the potential Warp 8 ship, it's going to be Admiral Garner's son is going to take over. Uh, and and do this. So what's really great is this whole opening sort of really introduces you to these characters, introduces you to the milieu. Now, we don't see any familiar characters that we know from Enterprise. These are all new characters. I think they were great characters. And this whole opening with this regatta, uh, I think, is, is, is great. It was a great way to introduce the, the characters. And this regatta basically ends on page nine. Also, there is a post, well, after the regatta, it says in the script, roll credits. And over the opening credits, we see a Romulan flagship approaching Earth. And the Romulan flagship has with it a sort of in, uh, lined up single file to hide their numbers, a, a long sort of necklace of drones of drone ships that we that we saw from in Enterprise. So Romulan drone ships are following behind uh, this Romulan flagship. And no one knows, there's hundreds of them. They're de in the script it says they're deployed single file in a line stretching thousands of miles. And uh, they, um, they uh, are coming at us from behind the moon. So they are hidden. And... Then after that, uh, after that goes the end credits, we have a, a great scene, a scene that I loved, where we find ourselves basically at a party, uh, a big party that's celebrating graduation, celebrating the end of the uh, regatta, and we are at Vulcan Ambassador Skon's, S-K-O-N, Skon's home. And his house is described as a multi-level terrace. Frank Lloyd Wright meets the 22nd century home of the Vulcan ambassador. And it, it describes that at this party, there is UESN graduates, Starfleet officers, human Vulcans, Andorians, Tellarites, Denobulans, Rigelians, dignitaries, and invited guests mill about to the music of a jazz quartet. Uh, three humans and a Vulcan are playing in a jazz quartet. And the Admiral's son, Admiral Gardner Jr., and Nikon 
are still uh, wearing their dress whites and they're having a good time. And I, there's a scene that I have to say, incorporating American uh, our pop culture that I thought was actually pretty funny, when they're actually they they're they're watching My Favorite Martian. And there's this great moment where this Vulcan male asks Nikon, you know, what what is this? And they don't understand what's the Vulcans don't get it. And Ambassador Scan's wife says, it's early 20th century television, and Ambassador Scan is a big fan of that kind of thing. And you find out the Vulcan ambassador has a fascination with science fiction. And the Vulcan male says, Science and fiction are two very different things. And it's very, it's very funny. I mean, it, it, it's a very funny scene. And um, uh, you realize that, that it's great because it asks the question, what would advanced alien races think of our science fiction pop culture of the 20th and now early 20th, 21st century? There, there's even this great moment where they, they switch to outer limits and they're, they're, there's a monster and one of the Vulcans thinks he recognizes uh, the uh, the creature in the outer limits from a planet, and he calls him. Isn't that an Alcadian? Which is actually kind of funny. And um, then there's a, a Denobulan who has a number of wives who is there, and they're talking about. It's very much like this scene in. Um, it reminded me of the scene in the Social Network with the same thing, the regatta, you know, in the in the Social Network when when uh, Army Hammer the um, the two twins. Are, are talking about you know why they lost kind of a thing it's 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 that kind of thing and there's a lot of talk where it tells you about the it sets up the whole power structure and how does starfleet work and all of this and what happens with the winner of the regatta and um it's it's very interesting and there's an andorian there and what you there's a lot of backstory that's dropped in but it's very it, it's it's very very much like a, a like whether it's Journey to Babel, you know, how do you vote Vulcan? And it's it's pretty interesting. And they do a lot of world building and backstory in this scene. And they talk about various politics. Like there's a great moment where the Andorian ambassador says, uh, and apparently they're, they're, what's going on is they're, they're, they're trying to figure out whether Earth should lead the Starfleet. And an Andorian ambassador says, but if the Andorian Imperial Guard, the Vulcan High Command, the Tellarites and the Rigelians can allow Earth Starfleet to assume command of their military forces. And then the Admiral says, no, 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 no. We're, we're hosts of the Coalition of Planets, Ambassador, equal partners, nothing more. So uh, the Tellarite ambassador, of course, is arguing, uh, you're going further than any of us. You're destined to do nothing but provoke trouble and interfere with the affairs of all whom you contact. There was no need for a coalition until your so-called exploration began. And then, of course, the Vulcan ambassador steps in and says, perhaps it would be logical for Starfleet to assimilate command of the Naval Academy and all other United Earth military forces if they wish to exercise jurisdiction over the military forces of other planets and cultures. So what they're doing here is is they're telling you about what Starfleet is. They're trying to define what Starfleet command is going to be. And it shows that while there's, there's, there's still... It's not totally solidified. There is... Um, there is cogent debate going on amongst the the federation, the new federation members, and it's it's good. I mean, I think it's uh, I think it's really good at this. It's done in a very interesting way, and I could see how when you're reading this, you're like, oh my god, this is it's so very Star Trek. It's so very interesting, and it it sets up uh, it sets up everything, and it, it's it's really great. There's even a Vulcan bartender at the party, which is something we've never really seen before. And um, we meet Jax, and Jax is kind of the Jax is kind of the cool, the the too cool for school. He's more like I, I imagine Jax as being sort of the Ice Man of the group, whereas uh, Tiberius Chase is more like Maverick, if you would call him that. And then, uh, uh, you know, it goes on, and this party scene goes on uh, all the way to um, let's see about page sixteen. So and then and then Jax asks asks Nicken, our our main the female main character who's also very capable and cool, and um, they're talking about whether they should date because Jax likes Nicken and you know there's definitely some sexual tension with these characters, and um, they they also have you sh you see that you see that the human characters are attracted to the alien characters as well like there's a a beautiful Andorian female and. Um, 
Jax is attracted to her. So it sets up the idea that there is definitely um, there people would humans would date aliens as we talk about on the show. So it's it's a very interesting. It does a really good job of setting up this the world the world of Star Trek very quickly, and it it's just fun. You know, it's fun. And then um, um, uh, Chase is uh, Gar- uh, Admiral um, Gardner's son, Gardner Jr. and Chase, who are clearly best friends. Uh, Chase's maneuver is talked about, and how he, he the, the fact that the billowing sail was what let them get over the finish line first, and all of that. Well, <clears throat> then they are talking about how Tiberius Chase still thinks that he's going to fly this mission. And by the way, the mission launches from Saturn, and that's where the, where the ship is going to be launched. And then Admiral Gardner takes Chase aside, Tiberius Chase aside, and says, tells him you're not going to be flying tomorrow. Um, and uh, Chase is very obviously upset about this, and they talk about his, that Admiral Gardner is uh, he's he's he he wonders he's like, look, you know, I'm I'm a little concerned about your your family. And the fact that you hail from Earth First people, even though he's already been through the the academy and all of that, uh, and then it turns out the admiral wants Gardner Jr., his his son, Chase's best friend, to fly the mission instead. So it's politics. Uh, he's being replaced by his best friend, whose father is the admiral, and. Uh, it's it's all very interesting, and it gets again. It gets into backstory. It's all world build, world building. It's all character development, and and all of that. And of course, uh, Gardner, Gardner Jr. and Chase talk about it. And Gardner Jr. thinks it's bullshit and thinks Chase should take over. And and it's okay. But Chase resolves himself that look, you do it. You do the flight, and it'll be fine. And it's going to be a big thing. And um. Uh, and all the, the friends are commiserating Jax, Nick and Chase and Gardner Jr. all talking about it. And, and they're, they're all talking about, uh, uh, how they have each other's backs, how they're going to be friends forever. And it's all very, all that camaraderie that you've seen in, in many different films, but that's why it works because all of this is very familiar. You know, you've seen it in other military movies, but it's done with a Star Trek twist. The fact that all that that woven in all of this, you learn about the politics of Earth and the other Federation members and where we're going. So it is it is a lot of backstory, but it's done in um, it's done very very well, and I, I really enjoyed it. And then Chase Tiberius Chase ends up meeting the mysterious Penelope, a new girl, a new woman that we've not we don't know before. And by page twenty, Penelope and Chase leave the party because chase feels like okay you know i'm not flying i'm i'm gonna take this mysterious girl with me and i'm gonna take her up to san francisco and you know we're gonna we're gonna i'll take her to see a view and we'll go out and basically chase then takes penelope this girl penelope up to watch the parasite meteor shower and they sort of they bond um and he tells her about the stars and he's very He's, and she's bored. She's like, I don't want to hear about the stars and the moon. And he's like, no, no, no. And and it's it's a, another it's another great scene where they're at Wolfback Ridge. They're looking at the stars together. And by the way, um, Chase has a, a, a flying motorcycle like we saw in the Kelvin at the beginning of Star Trek 09 when young Kirk steals a car. And it never made sense to me that that Kirk has a motorcycle uh, uh, with wheels on it in in the in Star Trek 09 but so Kirk does have a, a flying motorcycle because it is the 23rd century well no not it is not the 23rd century now I mean it's it's early it's time of it's it's 21 not the 23rd century not 22 so um but it's a great scene where they go bond and you realize that Tiberius Chase knows the stars and there's a uh there's a great moment when he's telling her all about um Let's see, what is the name of the um, uh, Arcturus, the star Arcturus, and what, where it comes from, what the Hawaiians called it, the star of joy. And, and, and she says, why? And he says, because when it was directly overhead, they were home. And so th- that's set up later. And it's, it's, um, it's really great. And then the meteor shower comes. By the way, we're at page 24 in the script now. 
uh, the Parseed Meteor Shower, or the Perseed Meteor Shower that we all know. So it's pretty cool, and they're 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 seeing that, and it's it's a great moment when these two characters are getting to know each other, and it's um, it's uh, I liked it. You know, it's you got you have your romance, you've got your your Kirk has been dissed, he's not going to fly the Saturn mission, but they get to they get to know each other, and it's good. Then we cut to we wipe to the matter antimatter warp test ship. And Admiral Gardner's son, Gardner Jr., and that's how he's called in the script, Gardner Jr. He's not given a first name. Um, so there is an incredibly exciting right stuff. We're getting into this Warp 8 ship, and everybody is, um, um, uh, is, is getting prepared. And at the same time, Penelope and Chase, uh, they, they, they slept on the mountaintop, and uh, they get up. And they're, they're, the day is broken, and um, Chase is, is, is looking through like a telescope about to, to watch all this that's going on. And um, then Penelope reveals that she is actually um, um, the sister. She's the younger sister of the Admiral's son. So she's also the Admiral's kid. She's the Admiral's daughter. And she neglected to tell uh, Tiberius Chase this. So, <clears throat> on page 30, the, uh, the ship takes off, and it's juxtaposed with Penelope and uh, Chase getting to know one another, and they're, they're talking about how, why is she there, and what, what's it like being the Admiral's daughter, and all of this, and at the same time, you're intercutting between this test ship going to warp, and beginning, it's very, it's very exciting, and Jax is there at Starfleet headquarters. The Admiral's there. Everybody's there watching this test. Now, remember, this is the end of Act 1. We're right at the end of Act 1 uh, when this test happens. So we're at, we're at page 30. While this test is going on, suddenly the Romulan ship with the thousands of miles long uh, drones makes its move. And suddenly, uh, all hell breaks loose. The Romulans and their drone ships attack Starfleet headquarters. And it's, it begins right on page 30. I mean, it's textbook screenwriting. So if you know, like the end of Act 1, all this setup has occurred. All the characters are introduced. The situations are, are there. On, literally on page 30, the Romulans attack. And it is a, a brutal attack against Starfleet headquarters. And as we later find out, they attack uh, the moon and they attack cities all over the world. And it's, it's a, an incredibly long action sequence and it's, it's, it's epic. Well, at the same time, uh, Gardner Jr. is still in the, the ship, the, the warp test ship, flying his warp test. He's unaware of what's happened and what's going on right now during this Romulan attack. And they talk about the Columbia, the NX-02. Oh, and the Enterprise uh, is... Um, uh, the Enterprise under the command of Archer is, uh, is at Risa right now. So the Enterprise is nowhere to be found. And there is this massive... I mean, it's, it's an incredible action sequence. And Chase and Penelope head back to Starfleet Headquarters. And Starfleet Headquarters is a flaming ruin and and all the characters that we've met are all involved and um it goes on and on and it's it's a great it's a great sequence and at the same time the 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 vulcan ambassador scon his son is introduced skull and skull is the scientist who designed the warp 8 engine so they are at titan station they're they're at saturn there and they're Titan and um, Titan Station, and they're overseeing the warp test because his team has built this engine, and so they're they're watching it, and um, while they're doing this test in the middle of this test, they're unaware that the Earth is being attacked. So they're monitoring this test from Saturn, and suddenly all the communications uh, go down, and it, it it all everything goes dark. There's no communications right in the middle of this warp test. And you have, like, Admiral Gardner, there's a commander named Commander White, and Ambassador Skull 
are are in the wreckage of Starfleet Command, and they're trying to make their way out. And now, by the way, we are at um, we're on page thirty five right now, and it's it's pretty great. And uh, Chase makes his way to an airbase, um, uh, a USN airbase, just north of San Francisco, the home of their top wing program. And they're trying to get into what are called SPADs, which are these small, like, they're like fighters, um, one-man fighters, the training fighters. And um, they're trying to do that and get in there and, and try and counterattack these, these drones that are attacking and then the drones start attacking this airfield and Chase goes after them and he's looking for, he's looking for Nix, he's looking for uh, Jax, he's looking for Nixon, looking for Jax, looking for um, his other friends. And uh, they find each other and they all start to work together and they're going to go counterattack. They're going to go counterattack these drones. And again, this is a long protracted action sequence that is, is intercutting between Chase and... Uh, Nicken and Jax and uh, the Admiral's son in the warp warp test flight ship and um, the attack on on Earth. And it's, again, it's an incredible sequence and it deals with all of these different points of view. So it's truly, really ensemble and it's really exciting and it goes on for basically another 10 pages. So now we are at page 40 in the script. And uh, Admiral Gardner finds out what happened. And there was a coordinated attack against Earth. The, the, um, the drones attacked Montreal, Paris, Moscow, Beijing, Cairo, Bahia, uh, and the global power station in Lisbon, Lisbon uh, Portugal. And that has been destroyed as well. And they're just getting visuals. So the Earth was really hit hard by these drones. And... The um, at the same time, while while they're still trying to figure all of this out, the Saturn test goes awry, and they push past warp seven. But as they were approaching warp eight, the engine, the warp engine, uh, malfunctions, and there's nothing they can do. The warp core is going to breach. So Gardner Jr., the pilot, um, he's going to die. And he decides to, in a last-ditch effort, he's going to get himself back to Earth and, and make a move against the Romulan flagship that's controlling all the drones and use the matter-antimatter explosion to take out the Romulan uh, ship that is controlling these drones. And he does just that. And it is... Uh, so Garner Jr., one of our four characters that we've come to know and love already... He makes a, a great maneuver and goes to Earth, or goes to Earth space, Earth and the moon, and he is able to, in a last-ditch suicide mission, take his damaged test ship and destroy the Romulan flagship, which crashes into the moon. Unfortunately, that causes all of the drones to switch to their AI mode. They're no longer being controlled by this Romulan ship, and they encircle the Earth. They take position around the earth and cut the planet completely off and all of the characters they're scrambling around they're trying to figure out what's going on why is this happening nobody even knows why the romulans have attacked the earth we are all licking our wounds and um it's uh we're now as far as page count goes we are basically up to page um 45 45 closing in on on 50 and um and he sacrifices his life. And it's it's pretty great. So the first 50, you're, we're now at the first 50 pages of the script. The Romulans have encircled the Earth with their drones. We've lost one of our main characters. The Earth is, is devastated. And we don't know yet what's happening. Why have the Romulans attacked the Earth? What is their, what is their deal? And um, so that is the first 50 pages of of the script and that is the setup and I have to say that I am I, I love this because 
you're you're seeing Starfleet Command that we know all about. You're meeting different Vulcan and and Dorian, Denobulan uh, dignitaries. You're meeting the Admiral, a new Admiral, not Admiral Forrest. Obviously, it can't be Admiral Forrest. But the new Admiral, Admiral Gardner, who I really like as a character. I liked his son. And I like our characters. I like Chase. I like Penelope. And their relationship continues during this um, attack to to blossom. And we, we've lost... Uh, one of our main characters in a in a test, as they said, a cataclysmic matter antimatter reaction, a catastrophic warp core failure of astronomical proportions. The shockwave radiates in three concussive dimensions, scattering a dozen drone ships and hurling the Romulan flagship directly into the moon, where it explodes on impact. And then after that scene, it jumps forward a little bit to August fourteenth, twenty one fifty nine. So that's where we're at. And um, uh, then there's this great scene between Ambassador um, Scon and Admiral Gardner. And Scon says that he wishes to apologize to the Admiral. And the Admiral's apologize. I mean, that's not the Vulcan way. Scon's like, I've received an encrypted message from Vulcan from Minister T'Pau. Of course, we know T'Pau. Celia Lofsky played T'Pau in the second season original series opener, Amok Time. We also saw T'Pau played in Enterprise during the fourth season in the three-part episode beginning with The Forge. So, again, it's all canonical Star Trek is just completely woven through the script in a delightful way. And uh, Admiral Gardner, uh, Scon says that he's got this encrypted message from to Pow and Admiral Gardner says encrypted. You're still keeping secrets from us, and Scon he regrets this, but that's the case. And Admiral Gardner says, "Well, that must be hard for you." And what's really interesting is you see the Admiral and you see Ambassador Scon. They have a really interesting relationship, and this conversation is. And you already like uh, Ambassador Scon because he likes American pop culture, and he obviously knows jazz. He had a jazz musician at his party, so it's the 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 character interplay and the people that you meet. Are, it's great. And, and you immediately, you recognize them as definitely archetypical Star Trek characters, but they're their own people. They're new and unique, and uh, it's very interesting. So they're having this conversation about diplomacy and uh, encrypted messages, and, and Gardner is saying, well, why, do you, why are you keeping secrets? And Admiral Gardner, uh, uh, when he says, I'm sorry, and, and, and uh, Scon says, I'm sorry for the loss of your son, that's what he's sorry about, not for keeping secrets. And Scon says he is struggling with the fact that it was his nephew, oh, not his son, pardon me, his nephew, who designed the Omega engine. So it's not Ambassador Scon's son. Skull was uh, a scientist who's his nephew who, was, who built the Warp 8 engine. And Admiral Gardner says, basically, like, look, he, he's, he's, uh, he says, you know, that's the occupational hazard for both my son and your nephew, and there's no need to apologize. Um... He says, I don't apologize. It's simply a fact for which I'm sorry. And then Scon says, I know why the encrypted message. I know why the Romulans have attacked Earth. And then it cuts to they go to his home. And I this is this is this is the crux of this script. And I I really love this. So now this is page 51 of the screenplay. Scon basically gives us backstory about the Romulans. And uh, he says that 1800 years ago, our species was on the brink of self-annihilation. We'd reached a level of technological sophistication, which gave us devastating means to express our anger. We were much as you were before your energy-based global economic system led to your Third World War. But the teachings of Surak, a philosophy of peace through logic, saved our people from extinction. And then his wife... Tavana comes and joins him. But there were those amongst us who would not embrace the teachings. They twisted the word of Surak into a faith which espoused violence as a logical expression of evolution and the expansion of our race. And in the fourth century, these dissidents fled to Vulcan and found to found their own society. They colonized five planets in the Beta Quadrant, but their search for a home world would not end until they settled on the twin planets of Romulus and Remus, where their extremist military militaristic society would flourish. And Admiral Gardner has never heard this before. This is the first time they're hearing any backstory about the rift. This is the first Earth person. Admiral Gardner is the first person on Earth who has heard this um, uh, story. And so Gardner says, what are you trying to tell me? And Scon says that seven days ago, 
when the Earth was attacked, it was coordinated with attacks on other planets. Amarcus IV, Lathro Prime, like Earth, these planets were home to large Vulcan colonies. The Romulans demanded that all Vulcans surrender and leave the planet that they're on or face the destruction of their host's planets. Uh, the Amarcans and the Lathropians forced us to evacuate and to board civilian transports. Once the Vulcans left the planets, they were all destroyed. 312,714 Vulcans were killed by the Romulans. So what is going on is the Romulans are going to, they're, they're, they're going to ethnic cleanse the Vulcans. They have come for Vulcans across the galaxy, and they deliver ultimatums to planets. The Vulcans must leave your planet. If they don't leave your planet, we will destroy you. So the Romulans have come back, and they are going to eliminate Vulcans across the galaxy. And they actually use the words ethnic cleansing. And uh, if the Romulan flagship had not been destroyed by Admiral Garner's son, they would have been given seven days to leave the planet. Now the Vulcans are trapped because the uh, Earth is encircled by these drones. And uh, the, there's, there's, a great, then there's a great debate about what Earth should do. And the president, there's the president of the Federation, um, and there's Admiral Gardner, and they introduce the president of the Federation, who's another great character. And there's a lot of discussing and debating about what should, what should happen. And Admiral Gardner says that perhaps this is a move to try and destabilize the entire Federation. And that's what they're going for. And the Federation president tells them, Ambassador Scon, please inform Minister Tapao that I might go down in history as the man who lost his own planet, but I will not betray one species or a race to another. That should no longer be a human option. As for your logic, sometimes the needs of the many and the needs of the few carry precisely the same weight. And uh, I love this. I love when, when you find this out. I think this is really interesting. It gives a credible threat. Uh, it makes what the Romulans are doing obviously have real world implications, things that we can understand. It's monstrous. And the president says he's going to invoke Presidential Order 49. There's going to be no record of this meeting. And the Romulans are going to be at Earth in 36 days. And what they have in 36 days to do is assemble what we have of the Federation, however many ships can get back to Earth, to defend the planet against a Romulan armada that is going to arrive to uh, either forcibly get rid of the Vulcans or destroy the Earth. And so that's where they're, that's, that's where we're at. So, uh, there's the setup. And now on page, um, on page 56, that's where we're at right now. And it's very interesting. All, all, all these things, all these things start happening and, and what, what are we going to do? And we have to coalition build and are these ships going to get here in time? And are we going to be able to defend Earth? Like, what is it that we're going to do? So what ends up happening is that we find out that this Warp 8 capable ship was not the only Warp 8, warp, warp eight capable ship that existed. Why, why have one when you can have two at twice the price? So they had created another Warp 8 ship. Well, so Tiberius Chase is like, you know, we could actually use a Warp 8 capable ship and we could get to Romulus before the Romulan fleet at the speed they're traveling reaches here. Because back then, you know, warp, traveling at Warp 8 for an extended period of time doesn't necessarily work. But, but if they were to leave now, they could do that. And so long story short, all of these machinations happen, and Tiberius Chase has to go see his father, Otto, who is still part of this Earth First movement. They've been stockpiling. It's actually kind of cool. They've been stockpiling weapons, and they have found an old 
they're they're using an old Nazi base, literally, where where Nazi flying saucers. And this is kind of goofy, I know, but but they have them there as antiquities. But um, it was it was a secret, of course, uh, Third Reich base. I mean, they didn't need to keep this in the script. I'm sure in a rewrite, this would probably go away. But but it is kind of cool. And uh, so Chase has to confront his father and basically says, look, I need a, a nuclear weapon. I need a nuclear weapon. And um, Chase commandeers the, the uh, Warp 8 ship that they've been building. Commandeers the Warp 8 engine and puts it into a, a Federation starship and they, or in Titan. And the Vulcan ambassador's son, or a nephew... And Chase's people, he, he gathers a team together, and they're going to go to Romulan space and get a little payback. And at the same time, the coalition forces are gathering around Earth, including Shran, including we, we, we see Ambassador Shran show up, uh, and, and, and the Enterprise. And it's, it's pretty cool, you know, and, and everything is leading up to this, this final battle. So the latter half of the script has both of these you've you've got all the characters that we've met that are sticking around on earth like Jax and Nixon and uh while Chase and he's meeting all these new characters and they're going to head off to Romulus and as you would imagine there is a a a huge a huge battle on both ends and it's it's very exciting it's very interesting and I loved it <laughs> so, uh, and what was, what's really cool at, at the end of the script, while the earth prevails, the battles in the, in the, the, the latter half of the script between the Romulans and the coalition forces, because you get to see, you get to see Tellarite ships, you get to see Vulcan ships, you get to see Andorian ships, and you get to meet all these characters and it's great. I mean, it's, it really is. It's like a world war two movie or, or it's, it's hunt for red October and, uh, and then at the same time, you have Tiberius Chase going to Romulus, and what they end up doing is they end up dropping a nuke onto Romulus, but at the same time, they're able to commandeer a Romulan ship. They basically are able to commandeer a Romulan ship that's heavily damaged, and the script ends with Tiberius Chase and his ragtag group only able to travel at warp two, and they're heading home. They don't get home. So the idea was that there was going to be two more scripts that were written that were going to deal with uh, the rest of the Romulan War that dealt with these, these two factions of characters, the characters we meet on Earth, and then Tiberius Chase and his ragtag crew in space. And it's, it's, it's really, really good. And it was really exciting, and it's really action-packed, and I really liked all of the characters. I, I like them all, and and it's a huge ensemble cast. And if you were to ask me what what was the tone of it, it is very much like Hunt for Red October. The beginning of it is it's very right stuff. It's very Top Gun. That's kind of how it how it begins. But it's not. It's 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 very earnest. It's not like lascivious. It's it's not. It feels very Star Trek, and it feels like. We're going to the academy. We're going to be better people. We're the best of the best. There's no like, ooh, you're gonna you're gonna have fights with underclassmen in the bar. There's none of that. It, it, it's all very much earnest, and um, I I really I really uh, really liked it a lot. And what's interesting about it was it's completely steeped. I mean, they're constantly dipping in to Star Trek mythology, like. Whether it's going to Saturn, like in the first duty, whether you're talking about T'Pau, whether you're talking about uh, Colonel Green, and and there's so much canonical fealty woven in, but it doesn't bog the script down. If you didn't know what they were talking about, it you it, it'd be like, yeah, that bounty hunter we ran into on Ord Mantell. If we, if we knew what that was, great. But if you didn't know what it was, that's great too. You it just becomes it just seems more authentic, and so the script. The script is really, it's a great script, and it's unfortunate. I would have seen, here, here, here's some things that if this script, I, I think this script should absolutely be made. I guess Paramount owns it. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what the disposition of this script is. I don't know if it was ever copywritten. 
I mean, it says on the script copyright, but there's no copyright date on it or anything like that. I'm sure he just wrote it there perfunctory. I, I, perfunctorily. I don't know how far down the road this went. It was only a first draft. The, the, the um, studio regime changed and nothing ever came of it. I'm sure that I don't know if this has ever been looked at beyond 2005 because I think if it had been looked at, if it had been considered, and maybe it's Rick Berman had something to do with it not being considered, I don't know. But it's definitely something, this could be made now. Not only could it be made now, yes, it's 15 years after the end of Enterprise. Then make it 15 years after. It's real time. You bring back Scott Bakula to play Archer, not in a big role. I mean, you could give him a big role if you want. You bring back Jeffrey Combs to play Shran, but you introduce all of these new characters, the Admiral characters, the Vulcan characters. I mean, it's, it's great stuff. And I think this script should absolutely be made, whether it's made as a theatrical feature, which I think it should be. And while it's special effects heavy, you know what? This doesn't have to be a $200 million movie. As a matter of fact, I think this movie should be made for... If anybody was really creative, make this for $75 million. It could be done. While, yes, there's epic action, what you do is you, you, you use your epic action sparingly, you know, and uh, you, you don't have an effects budget that breaks the bank. This is a character-driven piece. It's all really, as much as there's all this epic action, it's really about all the characters. And the characters, you know, shoot them in sets. Don't necessarily build giant things that have to have set extensions. You don't, you don't need Yorktown Station. You know, you go shoot this at the Water Garden where they have Starfleet headquarters. That's where you go shoot it. You know, go to San Francisco. You shoot it, shoot it on location out there. Go to Golden Gate Park or go wherever. You know, go to that ridge. This film could be made for a price. As a matter of fact, I dare say that Paramount should make this movie for a price. Call it if you want to go high. Go call it one one hundred and twenty-five million tops. A talented director, a talented effects team, could make this movie for a price, and you concentrate on your characters. And I think it could be a terrific film. And you know what? It could be canonically Star Trek, and it could be heck, make it for CBS All Access, whatever. I would just say that make it with a new production team. Take it away. It's it's a feature. It's a Paramount fil film. It, 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 it make it outside the purview of Secret Hideout. Have a new team of people come in and make this movie, and and make it canonically work with Enterprise because it's set in that era. Keep those designs. Keep keep everything they did, and do that. It does not have to be a wild reinvention of Star Trek. That's what I would do. That's what I would do with this script. And I would bolster parts. I would put Scott Bakula in it more. I mean, hell, if you wanted to, you could, you could, uh, I mean, it would be different with, in the, with the sun, but you could definitely have, I mean, if you wanted to change it around, you, you, you certainly could uh, make Scott Bakula, instead of Admiral Gardner, make him Admiral Archer and have him be a main character. I mean, that's a change you could make. And his son, who's graduating, could be, you know, have him skew younger. Although I don't know why he would be testing the, the Warp 8 ship. But you could make it work. And it's something that I think is definitely worth looking into. And they already own it. They already own it. And they're, I would bring back uh, Eric Jedrinson to do the work. And the, the draft is, is pretty much already there. And I would just, I would, I would bolster, I would tie it more directly to Enterprise by bringing, make Shran, instead of just a cameo, make him, make him a uh, part of it. You know, make him the Andorian admiral that's on Earth that he ends up leading the Andorian forces or something like that. And it would be great. And whether you do it as a, as a streaming film or do it as a theatrical feature, this script should be resurrected. They should make this and they should make a trilogy of these movies because... It's already on the page. It's already on the page. So there you go, Paramount. Here's my idea. Listen to the Inglorious Trexperts uh, podcast today and listen to Eric Jedrinson talk about... I mean, when you listen to him talk about how he wrote the script, you're like, yes, that's how you're supposed to approach Star Trek. That's the way to do it. 
You know, I've never, I've never once heard Alex Kurtzman say anything it, it, where he's excited about the Star Trek universe. He's always talking about these general things about what does Star Trek mean as a legacy. He's parodying talking points. Eric Jedrinson is a man who fell in love with the Star Trek franchise after he started watching it and felt a responsibility for what it was he fell in love with. Listen to his talk on the Inglorious Trek Sports podcast today. And then, um, yeah. Now, obviously, I will not be, so don't ask. I'm not giving this script to anyone. I'm not passing it along. So there you go. Uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm not even acknowledging that I have this script in my possession. Who knows? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. But I'm not going to give it up. I'm not going to give it away to anyone, even if I did have it. So there you go. But anyway, very excited about this script. I, I hope it gets made. It should absolutely get made. And um, it, this was everything. This is everything that they've wanted from Star Trek that they haven't received in the last 11 years, in my mind. In my mind. And now, I understand this script does work on familiar tropes, but it does what they were doing in Star Trek 09. Let's go back to Starfleet Academy. You know, and they do it in, in a very elegant, very uh, adventure, uh, adventuresome way. I mean, beginning this script with a great sea regatta is awesome. It's awesome. And um, I, I, uh, I loved it. It, it, it captured that sense of adventure. And you're out on the high seas with the wind in our back, something Kirk talked about in the original series. It's great. And this should get made. And it's amazing that it didn't get made. It's amazing that Paramount did not make this between, well, between the t I mean, I understand. At the time, J.J. Abrams, Mission Impossible 3, and uh, he was doing, Bad Robot was killing it on TV. I understand. But it, it would have been nice if, if somebody like Eric Jedrinson, who had done something non-Star Trek, which was Band of Brothers, brought that sensibility to this script, which is exactly what he did. And if that was the movie that was made, I think Star Trek would be in a much different position than it is now. It would have been completely reinvigorated by the script. You would have loved the characters, and, and it would have appealed to all audiences. It would have appealed to old Star Trek fans, and it would appeal to new Star Trek fans. And uh, boy, what a trilogy this would have made. Too bad it didn't, it didn't happen. But that doesn't mean it won't ever happen. You know, it took, what, 20 years for Martin Scorsese to make Gangs in New York? Maybe, just maybe, we might see the likes of this script come around again. But um, who knows? So before I get into letters, I, I, um, I, um, uh, I see that you have a lot to say. So let's see. Um, let's see what you guys have to say here. And I'm going to jump into this. So Willow is here. Willow says, I'm not generally the biggest fan of teen or high school dramas. But I think there are plenty of good modern movies with diverse characters. The Half of It, Booksmart, Love, Simon, Lady Bird, Edge of Seventeen, etc. At least modern teen movies no longer do stupid things like have a gong play when the Asian kid pops up on screen like Long Duck Dong and Sixteen Candles. Well, you've got me there. Uh, yeah, the donger is one of the more racist interpretations uh, of a character. I mean, I I uh, I agree with you. I think that all the movies that you mentioned, and all the perks of being a wallflower, is another teen film that I would say I really really like. Uh, I think they are good movies with diverse characters. And I I look, I really love Booksmart. I like Love Simon. I really like Lady Bird, and I liked Edge of Seventeen. I even like things like with Emma Stone's Easy A. And things like that. I, I think that um, there's a lot of great teen films. So, yeah, they, they have come a long way. And, you know, Revenge of the Nerds, Tom Cruise is losing it, uh, Porky's, uh, The Last American Virgin. Yeah, I think teen films have come a long way, which is probably pretty good. Um, Nick Parrish sends in a tip and says, what's up, Rob? Hope all's well today. So, Rob, I have nothing interesting for you today. Just a random question. Which actor did you like better as a horror movie protagonist back in the day? Donald Pleasance or Tom Atkins? Ooh, love Donald, but I'll take Tom. Well, you know, Tom's a little younger. Tom's more of a man of action. Obviously, we, we I really, uh, Tom Atkins is great. He's a badass. And you know what I love about Tom Atkins? I love his voice. I've always loved his voice. 
Um, I, you know, I, there's just something about him. I mean, he's like the man's man, and and he's he's a guy that will get it done. But but Donald Pleasance, I mean, I love Doctor Loomis in Halloween, but you know, he's an older guy. He's he's not a man of action. But you know, I I think especially Tom Atkins in John Carpenter movies, it's all good stuff. It's a good question. I I just think they're different. I wouldn't want to say I like one other rather than the other, but Tom Atkins is more fun. I think. I mean, Dr. Loomis is great, but, you know, he's an old guy. Not that that's a bad thing. Um, uh, Mark C. sends in a super chat and says, Camaraderie. Come on, Rob. We all know the cast has to be at odds, so their friendship, which is supposed to be a story arc, is totally uncomfortable and unearned. I thought you knew your Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean, we meet these characters after they've been bonded by going through the Academy. And they're the top of their class. Once again, you're dealing with people at the top of their class. One of the things I've always talked about Star Trek, uh, things that I like, is that you're dealing with the best of the best. They're the elite. Because you have to be that good to be on the edge of the final frontier. Um, I don't, I, the idea that there are characters that are vaguely incompetent uh, is ridiculous to me. That are on the spectrum. I mean, I understand they're, they're, the, your diversity quota. The universe is indifferent to your suffering. The universe doesn't need quotas. The universe will kill you at the drop of a star. Uh, the idea that you would have anybody less than perfect, I know human beings aren't perfect, but 99% perfect or aliens that are 99% perfect, new Star Trek would have you believe that there are people that are not, they're not the best of the best. And I hate that. One of the things that I loved about Star Trek was not only was it optimistic, it was aspirational. You wanted to be as good as the people on this show. That was part of the appeal. Now somehow being elite is somehow bad. I don't get it. I don't understand. So thanks for that, Mark. Kelly Parks sent in a super chat. And uh, thank you. Kelly Parks sent in another super chat and said, I'm not buying the attack. Just as the U.S. has defenses, so would the solar system in this era. The attack would be met with force instantly. Oh, it is. It is. And, and I, 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 didn't, I guess I glossed over that. But the, the attack is it's decimated. So... Um, and also, you know, remember they were not on any kind of a defensive posture. They're, they're not, they're not expecting it. I mean, I understand after the Zindi attack and after the fourth season of Star Trek. Okay. But, and they do have defenses, but it's, uh, they are, it's very much, it's very much evocative of Pearl Harbor. I mean, we had defenses in Pearl Harbor. We were caught with our bridges down and, uh, that was kind of how this attack goes. Um, Jason Whitcomb says, was Harv Bennett's Starfleet Academy ever scripted? You know what? I don't know. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, I, I, uh, uh, that's a good question. Mark Altman would know the answer to that. Um, Stubble McShave sends in a tip and says, I found the initial inspiration of the Iliad and the Odyssey for the first two movies interesting. When he described the attack as a Pearl Harbor type attack, it made sense. Great Trexperts episode that everyone should check out. Well, Stubble, I'm glad that you, you, um, you, um, saw that. Yes. I mean, I, I would encourage again, I cannot stress enough how everybody should go listen to today's Inglorious Trexperts podcast about with the interview with Eric Jedrinson, so you can hear from the horse's mouth exactly where he was coming from uh, for the script. Uh, my desire was to try and illuminate it uh, more uh, about the plot and things, so you could listen to sort of my how I address this. And again, I, I didn't go into detail on the latter half of the script because I kind of wanted it to leave it all sort of a little vague for everybody because it's, it's action-packed and amazing. But... Um, yeah, it's good stuff. Kelly Parks goes on to say, Earth has no defenses. Why do No, it it is. They're, they have defenses, but it's a sneak attack. It's been planned by the Romulans. And remember, you know, it's there's nothing nothing like this has ever happened before. So it, it's very, it's very plausible. And our defenses do get decimated. There is defenses. Um oh, the German angel. The German angel uh, says, greetings, Rob, to my knowledge or by the tracking results. It seems the postman has left a pa package on your doorstep. Have fun opening it. Hope it's still in good shape. Not like one of the last two, which looked like it had been through hell and back. Well, I will check that out, Dieter. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I will open it. I will wait to open it on tomorrow's show. Um, 
Brendan Sheehy sent in a super chat and says a two hour origin story introducing a new ensemble cast is notoriously difficult. A TV show leading into a movie with established cast works more for Star Trek, in my opinion. Right. But I would say that this is from the guy who, who did Band of Brothers, who did a pretty good job introducing an ensemble cast of characters. I think this script works really, really well. And if you think about it again, you go back and you look at movies like The Right Stuff and sure the right stuff, even though it introduces the seven Mercury astronauts and a couple of them are given short shrift, it does a pretty good job of introducing an ensemble cast, and there's a lot of characters in that movie. Same with a movie like Hunt for Red October. A lot of characters in that movie, but it works. It works. And um, I, uh, I thought it was a great script. And remember, you know, uh, this was written by somebody who whose work, uh, he, it was coming out of reality, like of what happened in World War II. The story of Easy Company, and if you listen to if you listen to him, I guarantee if you listen to Jedrinson on this podcast on the Inglorious Trexers podcast, you'll listen to him and you'll think to yourself, "God damn it, why wasn't he allowed to continue on? And why didn't this get made? Why didn't this get made?" And the great thing about it is, it still can, because it's a period piece set in the Star Trek universe. Let's make it 15 years after Enterprise. There's takes place in real time. That way Scott Bakula can play himself. You know, why not? So I think I think it should happen. Anthony Gonzalez sends in a tip and says, Toward the end of the Dominion War, I would have had a scene where a Starfleet task force is cut off and thought lost. A mention of the loss of the Alpha Quadrant when a portals-like scene occurs and the Gorn, Orion, the Tholian, and the Ferengi ships arrive. That would be cool. I would love that. That would be neat. Um, uh, I, I think that would be great. I love that idea. But what's so cool about this movie has a lot of uh, interstellar uh, coalition foo. There's a lot of the Tellarites, the Orions, the uh, not the Orions, the Tellarites, the Andorians, the Vulcans. I mean, it's really, 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 really cool. And it would make a it'd be, it'd be great. It'd make a great look. They should do this as a limited series. I mean, if, if you think about what they would do, have Jedrinson come in and make it a 10-part limited series for CBS All Access if that's what they want to do. You know, if you want to do it as a... I guarantee you, you would get more. But I, I think this should be a theatrical feature. I really do. But I, I, I think it should be a theatrical feature that should not cost $200 million to make. This film should be made for a price. It should be... It, the, the philosophy of how Star Trek was always made... That it's all characters in rooms. You cut to special effects when you need them. But it's all about the human drama. You know, and this has a lot of characters. You need somebody, you need a really great director who understands this material. Uh, Mark C. says, Willow needs to watch the greatest teen movie ever made, Better Off Dead, with John Cusack. I want my $2. Also with bad Asian and newspaper boy stereotypes. Yeah, you know, it's it's... Here's what I what makes me sad. It makes me sad that in our current, I don't know, identitarian woke world, that so many of these things that that we had are are going to fall by the wayside and and they're just going to be forgotten and people are going to declare them garbage. When you think like those movies are 35 years old and the world has changed. Um uh 200 watt studio since send, send in a super chat and says where can i find this script if it exists uh, do you think i made it up this is like when i read the duel of the fate script uh people are like burnett made that up no i didn't make this up listen to eric jedrinson again i i i, I direct everybody over to the inglorious trexperts podcast that dropped uh this week about uh, it, it it's an interview with eric jedrinson and his he'll he'll get into his whole philosophy of where he came from and why he was writing it this way and it's a really interesting story and it'll make you weep because you certainly have never heard anybody of the current Star Trek administration who's run Star Trek for the last 12 years talk about Star Trek the way he does you always get these general platitudes Star Trek has always been about inclusion like really I, I would like to know what your your philosophy to the approach of Star Trek is Michael Shabon's talked a little bit about it, but um, I, I never feel that these people really know Star Trek. Whereas Jedrinson went and took a deep dive, literally a deep dive into Star Trek mythology, and and he was going to pay uh, respect to the franchise, 
And it's a pretty spectacular, I think, uh, thing. I really think it's it's great. Um, yeah, it's 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 really great. Mark C sends in. Uh, he says you need to review the J.J. Abrams script flyby. Just remind the chat to bring a puke bucket. Oh, I have. As a matter of fact, I have all of the animatics for flyby. When I was working on Superman Returns, I got all that stuff. Uh, I I will say this. There's one thing I really liked about that flyby script. When Tizor, the Kryptonian, and Superman are fighting at the end in Metropolis, there's this great scene, at least the animatic is great, where they're using their heat vision against one another. Two Kryptonian heat vision in the middle. And it, the, 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 the heat wave that's emanating out from them starts to literally melt skyscrapers. And they start falling in and around them. It's cool. Uh, Kelly Parks says, Pearl Harbor was hit and run. They didn't successfully conquer Hawaii. Well, neither did the Romulans. It's same thing. It's a hit and run. It's hit and run here. You know, they basically, and then blockade the earth and give us an ultimatum. They don't, they don't occupy earth. And they're like, give us, give us the Vulcans. Give us the Vulcans or we'll blow you up. And I really like that. I, I think the idea that the, the, what was happening, um, back, back then, uh, Jedrinson was thinking about like the Balkan conflict and all of that and, and the ethnic cleansing that was going on. I think that's a really interesting idea that the Romulans are making a move to get rid of Vulcans. Uh, I thought that was really, really interesting and diabolical and, and uh, disturbing all at the same time. I thought that was, was definitely something that um, I could get behind. I thought it was cool. Um, Bunyan Snipe says, I would love to see a medieval-style period piece set before the Vulcans discovered spaceflight or during their industrial revolution. I, I think that's a great idea. But again, you would need somebody, I think that would be a really hard sell because a lot of people would be like, wait, what? Like, you would need, you need expert screenwriters. Um, um, two, oh, 200 Watt Studio says, I meant you said may not exist in your possession. Yeah, I can neither confirm nor deny that um that i have this script in my possession um you know well it's not or, or, i've got so many electronic files on my computer system i mean i literally have 90 ter no i've got i have 98 terabytes in my system here of 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 data of various things <laughs> so you know who knows what's in there I might have copies of all three original Star Wars movies in 4K. Who knows? It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, so let's see uh, what we got going on here. Mm-hmm. I've got I've got a lot of letters, so let's uh, let's jump into these letters. The first letter that I have today comes from Terry Flynn. Terry Flynn says, "Dear Rob, Terry Flynn, formerly our moderator and the sheriff of Nottingham. Unfortunately, I missed your most recent episode of Viewer Letters and Comments. This letter would have fit better there, but I thought I'd send it anyway. It concerns the effects of the pandemic on movie theaters." My father's last trip to the cinema was probably when he took my mom and us to see Superman 2. <laughs> Nevertheless, he recognizes that the cinema industry, although not his thing, is important to so many others. He had to make a decision recent recently that pained him. Broadway Cinema, the premier independent movie theater in Nottingham, asked his company for a quote to produce curtains, screens, etc. to help them stay viable in a COVID-19 world. My dad reluctantly declined. Why? because he no longer has the capacity to produce enough curtains and screens. Why? Because as COVID-19 broke out, he realized the spun polyester used in his Japanese soji blinds, adored by customers, particularly Japanese expats who have kids and or cats, and are fed up replacing washi paper traditional panels, is almost exactly the same as that used in clinical grade masks. He retooled immediately to produce masks, which meant people in nursing homes are living who otherwise might have died. But manpower issues, he now can't produce enough quantities required for some potential clients like the Broadway cinema. I imagine Broadway has only a pretty short list of potential suppliers who could help them revamp to a standard that addresses most people's fears. 
Though I'm somewhat infamous for hating the antisocial behavior in cinema chain theaters and thus regard visits as a treat, I would never dance on the grave of cinema if it comes to their death. Having a PhD in medical statistics with links to people in immunology, I know a vaccine for COVID-19 might never come or might be like a flu vaccination that leaves the disease endemic with knockoff effects on social events like cinema. If cinema dies, for me, it'll be like laying flowers on the grave of the uncle you wish you knew better, the uncle who fought in a particular war. Maybe he had nothing of note to tell, maybe he had plenty, but he occasionally gave amazing antidote, anecdotes and his contribution was important nonetheless and it behooves us to remember him. Oh man, Terry, you're killing me with this. Um, well, that's a great story. It's a sad story, but I, I hope I hope cinema doesn't die. Um, that would that would that would bum me out. Um, but a good letter nonetheless. So thank you for sending that in. I wow. Um, maybe if you took your dad to the cinema again, he would see that they need those. But I I understand. I I I I can't I can't. Well, he did the right thing. You know, I mean, movies are a luxury, entertainment's a luxury, I know that. But it's a great letter. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that story. Uh, hi, Rob. This is a letter to both you and the post-geek singularity. I recently had laser eye surgery, and as a result, I've had to stay in a dark room and avoid TVs and computer screens for a few days. And as somebody whose whole life revolves around both, I knew this was going to be a difficult task. However, before going for my operation... A friend suggested that I download Audible and get some audiobooks to listen to while I recover. I'm not much of a standard book reader, but I do read a lot of comic books, so I figured I'd give it a shot. And what do I see when I logged into Audible for the first time? Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Sandman is a series I've always heard so much about, but I never actually dived into. Mainly because it's a pretty big series and I wasn't sure where to start exactly. Well, after listening to the audiobook over the last couple of days, I feel it's now my duty to advise anyone who hasn't treated themselves to Sandman to do yourselves a favor and get this series as quick as you can. I have no doubt that you, Rob, have already read the legendary series, but even still, I must tell you to give this audiobook a shot. If you have the time, that is. It's 11 hours. I've listened to the first... It's, it's incredible. First of all, the Sandman is my favorite comic series of all time. It is, it is really a comic book series about storytelling itself. And I love, love, love it. Uh, I can't, I, 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 there's not, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love the Sandman so much. That Sandman audio series is, I haven't finished it. It's incredible. As I work here in the Rob Observatory and I, late at night, I've put it on. I haven't got through all 11 hours yet, but it's amazing. And I grew up, I loved audio dramas as a kid. And the Sandman is absolutely, it is stellar. The production value, the performances, that Neil Gaiman is really the narrator. Ugh, it's amazing. The production value of this book astounded me. It's been crafted with love and by true fans, as well as Gaiman himself. And don't even get me started on the A-list cast. Andy Serkis, Michael Sheen, Taron Egerton, Riz Ahmed, Kat Dennings, and none other than James McAvoy as a titular Sandman himself. Gaiman narrates, and there's even a Tony Todd cameo as John Jones. The audiobook has 20 chapters and covers the first three volumes, I believe. From the performances to the soundtrack to the general love put into the series, I can only hope they continue to adapt it to cover the full comics run. What a jumping on point for anyone look to hop into the series. I'm glad I did, and I really can't recommend it enough. It certainly helped me recover from the first few days of surgery, and I feel I owe it some love for that alone. DC have signed a deal with Audible recently to produce licensed content, and if this is anything to go by, then I can't wait to see what comes next. Anyway, Rob, I must retreat back to my dark room now. I hope this letter increases Sandman sales somewhat. I need more. Kind regards, Cathal from Ireland. Man, well, Cathal, let me tell you, um, it's awesome, and the Sandman is, as I said, my favorite comic book series of all time. It's amazing. And boy, did they knock that out of the park. Uh, I, I love listening to CBS Radio Mystery Theater as a kid, man. I love audio dramas, and it's one of the best I've ever heard. And the production value is just astonishing. It's just astonishing. Uh, this one comes from Michael Preston. Dear Rob and the Post Geek Singularity, I wanted to talk about the future of movie theaters. I feel fairly safe using social distancing to enter theaters in early September, but Regal Cinemas has said they won't be requiring masks unless they have updated this policy recently. 
I don't know about you, but I'm willing to carve my way through a theater of Jemadar soldiers to get to my seat to watch Tenet or Snake Eyes, but mostly Tenet. I don't really believe theaters are a thing of the past, despite the saber rattling of the prophets standing on the streets saying the end is nigh. I mean, I have a 100-inch projector screen, 5.1 Dolby Digital, and I still want my theaters back. I could point out that everyone I know has the illusion that everything will just be on streaming or that theaters will be gone, but I have faith that at the very least, people want to go out for the movie experience. Damn, I'm starting to jones for a three-story high movie screen. Guess that's all for now, and remember, in the end, go back to the beginning and stay safe. Michael Preston. Michael, look, I think movie theaters are going to come back. I do. But I do think it's an inevitability that movie theaters eventually are reserved only for big theatrical events. Um, I don't think we're, we're going to see a definite, definite contraction of the movie industry in some way, shape, or form. I, I mean, I really do believe that. Um, we shall see. We'll, we'll see. I mean, I, you know, again, I don't know, but we'll see. Um, so, yeah. This one is from Desmond Kingston about last night's episode of Whining About Movies. I just watched your La La Land episode of Whining About Movies. I think it's interesting and beautiful how people can perceive one piece of art so differently, yet still have the same level of appreciation for it. A good film transcends a demographic and tells a universal story. I think people need to remember that this is why we watch movies. To be impacted, to have an experience. To laugh, to cry, to be angry, etc. And there's nothing we can do about the way a film affects us. People are so often judged about their opinion on different things and what they thought about a certain movie. And at the end of the day, you can't help how a movie made you feel. You can talk about it all you want, about how how well made it is, how structurally impressive the script is. But I think the most important thing is, did this two-hour experience make me feel something? And if so, what? And why? Everybody will have slightly different answers to these questions for each film, and that's what I love so much. That's what starts conversations and debate. But at the end of the day, we all need to be respectful of other people's opinions, because they're just being honest about their experience. We shouldn't be afraid to give our honest thoughts on pieces of art just because one thing is regarded higher than another. For those of you who might not know what he's referring to, uh, Elizabeth and I had a very cantankerous conversation uh, about La La Land yesterday. I was uh, I got very uh, impassioned, as did she. Uh, it was interesting because to get you wouldn't have thought that La La Land would have would have certainly got my uh, dander up as much as it did, but it did. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people think maybe I was a bit of a dick, a little too harsh, but um, I don't know. I mean, we had this conversation, and, and I think what was I thought, it was a very interesting divide between how men and women see things, and I thought it was a, a worthwhile discussion, and if you want to watch it, you should. Uh, it's up. You can, you can check it out, but you should see La La Land first. You really should. I also think it's interesting how nostalgia can influence our enjoyment of a film. I think of things like Star Wars prequels, which I grew up watching. To this day, I am able to rewatch all of them and get enjoyment out of them, and I think a lot of that has to do with nostalgia. But I wonder, why would I still go back and keep rewatching these things if I didn't actually think they were good movies? So I vividly remember the opening night of Man of Steel. I was 12, and it was my first big introduction to Superman. I remember absolutely falling in love with the character. Who wouldn't? It's such a great character. I absolutely loved the film then, and I love it now. Today, after having read countless Superman comics and stories and seeing every Superman film, Man of Steel still remains my favorite movie. Is it simply memories of a simpler time when I was young, experiencing this amazing larger-than-life character for the first time? Rewatching it now, I do think it's a beautifully made film. I tear up just listening to certain parts of the score, and the You Are My Son line gets me every time. I seem to be rambling, but it's something interesting to think about. Again, I think the way we all experience films differently, and the reasons why, is the most special thing about the art form. The environment we grow up in shapes how we interact with and view society. And as art is often a reflection of society, our perception of art is shaped in a similar way. Well, if you saw uh, this film, uh, you would be, when you were 12, what would that make you? Would that make you 
19 or 20 now. What a, what a great letter you've, you've written, Desmond. Uh, very impressed. So please write more. And uh, this is a great letter. You know, I think you also bring up a, a, a huge point, uh, a really good point, And that is, you know, when we see certain things really affect us and when we're hit by certain things, it's important. And I think one of the interesting schisms that fandom has with, say, a movie like Man of Steel is <laughs> obviously there was decades of su Superman stories before Man of Steel came on the, on the scene. And everybody who had been steeped in Superman mythology and lore had a very specific idea of what they wanted to get from a Superman movie, especially in light of the fact that the MCU had existed for half a decade before Man of Steel came out. And I think a lot of people uh, did not like the way Superman was portrayed in Man of Steel, which I've never really understood. I mean, I, I understand it. I just don't agree with it because it's a new take on Superman. And the idea that, that, that it's supposed to be like an old take now, People would say, well, Rob, what about Star Trek Discovery? And I'm like, but Star Trek Discovery is trying to get, to get you to believe that it's part of canonical Star Trek. And they're asking you to believe that it took place before uh, the original series. And I, I don't see any shred of that in the, sh in the show. Whereas, in a way, I think of Superman, I think of Man of Steel as sort of uh, the, the, the casino royale of Superman. In that we've watched James Bond just become a double O. At the beginning of the movie. In Superman, we see Superman become Superman halfway through the movie. And his next couple of days, uh, he's just trying that, that on. So this idea that we're supposed to have Superman be fully formed doesn't make sense to me. But I'm glad that you uh, liked it. And I really, what a great letter you had written. Thank you so much, Desmond. Um, great stuff. Great, great letter. These are great letters today. Um, I'm telling you. Uh, oh, hang on. And we have one from Omar94. Omar says, Hi, Rob. One thing I find lacking in verisimilitude is how we see a lot of times, but not all the times, when different cultures on Earth, or even aliens, all speak English. For example, in the movie Gladiator, all the characters speak English, even though they would have probably spoken Latin if it was realistic, as it takes place in ancient Rome. In the most recent God of War game, and even the previous ones, everyone speaks English, despite the stories being set in ancient Greek and Norse mythology eras. There are some exceptions. Star Trek had Klingon as a language for an alien species. James Cameron hired a linguist to construct a language for the Na'vi in Avatar, instead of just doing the trope of aliens speaking English, English all the time. In the Disney animated movie Atlantis, The Lost Empire, a long language was constructed for the Atlanteans, instead of them always speaking English. I get having all the characters speak English makes it easier for people who are watching, but still, I don't see why creators couldn't have their characters speak the language of the era the stories were set and just put all subtitles in English. However, I don't know if that would work, since I remember reading once how American audiences are too lazy to read subtitles. Thanks. Live long and prosper. Well, Omar, I think a lot of it has to do with where the, where the, where the, where the movie is being made. Like, if you're going to make, say, Gladiator, if you're going to make a Gladiator movie, like, I would love to see South Korea make a Gladiator movie. Like, what would that look like? And they cast all South Koreans in the roles, and they only spoke Korean. You know, would you buy it? Like, I've, I've often wondered, like, why do we believe, like, this idea that we believe Jesus is a white man. That part of the world, 2,000 years ago or whatever, why would we believe that? Like, whenever I see uh, images of Christ, how he's portrayed in the Western world, I'm like, I, that just doesn't look like that. It's the same thing. I mean, I think people, people, uh, it's easiest to make reflections of things using what we have now. You know, the idea that what are you going to do? Teach an entire cast how to phonetically pronounce Latin? I mean, they wouldn't really know what they were saying, so you really would never get a great performance out of them. Because they wouldn't know unless someone spoke Latin fluently. But how can you speak Latin fluently around here? I guess you could speak academic Latin. Uh, so I think they, that, that is the only solution. It's sort of an elegant solution, but may are inelegant, but yeah, I, I uh, how would you do that? I don't know. Um, but I understand what you're saying. Colin Norris writes in and says, I know you're a fan of Henry Cavill's portrayal of Superman, but where do you land on how the characters managed in film? I find it a bit muddled. In Batman v Superman, not only did most people seem to hate him, he seemed to hate being Superman. I get that after the Metropolis fight, a lot of people would hate him, but unless he was doing nothing in the interim, a lot of people would love him too. 
Imagine if he saved Elizabeth from certain death. I think he'd be good for dinner at your house for the duration, and you'd probably be the guy in the bar loudly defending him when a network gives him bad coverage. It seemed like Snyder was hell-bent on fixating on the fact that people would distrust him and ignoring the fact that many of us would be grateful for him. Take the bus rescue in Man of Steel. A kid uses what has to be otherworldly powers to rescue your child and a few dozen others from drowning, so you go scream at the parents and threaten them? I know people can be assholes, but that's a stretch. I always imagine Smallville having several people who knew something's up with him by the time he's grown, and they close ranks around his secret because he's got Uncle Joe to the hospital at light speed or rescued somebody's kid from drowning or tended somebody's farm way too thoroughly when they were sick. The fact that he seems so miserable saving people in Batman v Superman put me off as well. I found a neighbor's dog for them after it had been missing for almost five days, and the gratitude they expressed had me on a high for the rest of the night, and the John Williams score playing in my head. I'm betting I'd be pretty stoked to rescue a kid from a burning building. The Snyder movies were just too stacked towards how bad it was for him without what I feel would be an honest portrayal of the good he'd experience as well. I might just be too old school because I don't want a Superman who is always relatable. I want a Superman who is aspirational, an exceptional man even without powers. Another thing that shocked me was that the film the director claimed would bring more realism to Superman, his Clark Kent was basically the same guy with glasses. I mean, how the hell did Perry not notice Superman is wearing glasses and working for him? I know it's a dicey concept, but Reeve acted the hell out of the difference between the two and at least earned a pass. Maybe Clark has a country accent and has to lose it when he's in costume or something along those lines. I think it's time to admit that he needs to be involved in world affairs in a meaningful way. To be fair, Batman v Superman fiddled with it a bit in the opening and consequences later on, but I think it needs more focus. He should probably step in and stop genocide. A guru is anyone? after waiting for us to do it for as long as he could stand. Then people are polarized by it. Governments turn against him while many other people are for him. Lex finds a way to profit off it and make things even dirtier, and I'm sure a supervillain can fit in somewhere so he can punch someone. <laughs> I'm no writer, but something like that. Also, out of all the careers he could have chosen, he's a journalist. Yes, it keeps his ear to the ground, but in the comics he also took it seriously as a career, and I think that's more relevant than ever right now. That's been glossed over as well. I think ultimately we need a story where things are a mess and Superman is right even though things aren't perfect. The limits and consequences of his powers could be explored in a more real-world way. He can do things by force, but he can't make us want to do the right thing and he doesn't want to terrify all of humanity into it. What if he lost his powers and over a passage of months gets more frustrated and thinks of things he wishes he would have done with them? How different would it make him when he gets his powers back to have spent a year vulnerable with more time for friends and a life and then having to tackle problems as a mortal man? In Superman 2, he was powerless for a short period of time. What, it was for a year or so, and it wasn't his choice. I'm rambling, but my point is, I think there's a lot left to do with the character on screen, and I haven't even mentioned Brainiac yet. I feel like a 90s image comic approach has been dusted off and applied cinematically, and that definitely scratched some people's itch, and I'm glad for them, but I wish they'd forget mixing him with other heroes for now, and while we're all impressed with CGI and fights, I'd like it if they'd really dig into the character and the nearly century of stories that have been told about him. I often wonder about the people in charge and how much they look into these characters before greenlighting a movie or agreeing to direct or write one. You'd know more about that than I. Thanks so much for your time and your always thoughtful answers. Colin. Well, Colin, what a great letter. You know, I love the fact that people write in multiple letters about Man of Steel on the same day, and how could you plan that? You know, you can't. Great letters. That was a great letter. I agree with you. Like, I, I would love to see, I've talked about this before, and I forget who wrote the, the comic book, and I keep mentioning this story, but and I know some of you have heard me say it, but one of my favorite recent Superman tales was Clark Kent, like you said, really likes being a reporter, and he takes pride in the stories he writes, and he really wants to go cover this event in Europe, but he has to have Perry sanctioned to do so, because in order to go to Europe as Clark Kent, he'd has to, he would have to be a civilian and travel, air travel and all of that, even though he could zip over in a, in a, in a jiffy. And Perry White says, you have to cover these three mundane stories in one day. And you have to turn your stories in in the same day. And if you don't, you can't go. But if you do, you can go to Europe. And of course, all hell breaks loose in Metropolis. He has to fight the Toy Man. He has to deal with some other shenanigans. And he ends up not able to do it. But Perry comes to him the next day and says, thanks, Clark. You know, good job. And it turns out Lois uh, turned in the stories for him. Cover the, I thought that was great, and it would be really interesting to see a Superman movie where he's fighting maybe for free speech, maybe he's fighting against some kind of uh, something political, as Clark Kent, 
So while he's dealing with being Superman, he also, as a civilian, as Clark Kent, is doing something he's equally impassioned about. I'd love to see a Superman movie about that. I think that's a great idea. And I, I have to say, I, um, I, um, I couldn't agree with you more. 100%. 100%. So, yeah, I love that. I love that idea. Uh, this next letter comes from Ian Samuels. Rob and fellow Rob observationists. With the poor attempts at new Star Trek that has been vomited onto our screens and the premise of an animated series called Lower Decks, which looks more like Rick and Morty than Star Trek, which is not surprising as part of the team working on it as part of the team from Rick and Morty, maybe it's time for something different. Some time ago, I had an idea, which is called Star Trek Deep Space Gamma. Um, it has been 21 years since Deep Space Nine ended, so Deep Space Gamma starts 21 years after the end of Deep Space Nine, and we find a writer, we find writer and journalist Jake, Jake Sisko on Deep Space Nine, now called Bajor One, looking out the same window as he had in the last scene in DS9. He's joined by General Kieran Arise. Why hasn't he returned? He said he would, Jake insists, obviously speaking about his father, Benjamin. When was the last time you saw him, Kira asks. Jake shrugs, 20 years ago. They watch as another Cardassian nor station is being moved by runabouts into the open wormhole. Are you here to do a story on the Gamma Station, Kira asks Jake. No, I'm here to board a ship for Earth. I've got an exclusive. The story goes that there was this highly respected, highly decorated Starfleet captain who fought during the Dominion Wars, but then he disappeared. Rumors of a secret mission, and he's kicked out of Starfleet, but not officially court-martialed or anything. For the first time in more than 20 years, he's agreed to tell his story and has asked for me to do the piece. The ex-captain Jake is going to interview is named Charlie Wright. He scored highest ever score in tactics at the Academy and received one of the highest ever scores in the Kobayashi Maru test. Highest score without cheating, that is. Anyway, he'd work his way up through the ranks and at one point even working as a tactical officer on the Enterprise D under Captain Picard, but he was only on the Enterprise for a few months before he got offered the position of the first officer on the USS Hood, where he would serve during the Dominion War, but his captain ignored his advice once and was ordered off the bridge for arguing with his superior. The captain is killed in the attack and Wright takes over and is given the field rank of captain. Due to his continued excellent service, he's picked for a secret mission. The mission is uh, in two parts. The first is the USS Valiant under the command of Red Squad, an elite group of students from the Academy. Wright is put in command of the second part, a specially selected expert crew, also of the Defiant class USS Star Shadow, named after the Sea Shadow, an experimental stealth U.S. Navy ship. Their duties were to take out targets behind enemy lines. Wright discovers that the mission was designed to fail. After taking out targets, they were given a final uh, impossible mission where the ship and the crew were not expected to return, upholding the secrecy of the mission. As Jake is interviewing Wright, Admiral Catherine Janeway has been in meetings all day for the eighth day in a row, returns to her office. The meetings have been about choosing the commander of the new Deep Space Gamma project. She discovers a new message on her computer, a message that claims to be from Captain Benjamin Sisko and the date sent a month after his disappearance. The message suggests Captain Charlie Wright as the commander of Deep Space Gamma Project. She checks with Bajor 1 and they have no record of the message being sent, but the codes are all accurate. The next meeting she following, she brings it up and everyone agrees. So Wright returns to Starfleet with a clean record and with the rank of Captain takes command of Deep Space Gamma. So as a premise, what do you think? I mean, that sounds okay to me, you know, I mean, but it is just a premise. So this guy takes control of a space station. I mean, then what? You know, what's really interesting is there's a series of Star Trek novels that deal with a space station that are great called Star Trek Vanguard. And if you haven't read those books, they're really, 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 really good. They're not, they're, they're set in the original series era, but I think it's a good premise. I mean, I like that idea, you know, just try and sell it as a book series to, to uh, make it a Star Trek book series. Um, but I, you know, I'd buy off on that. I'd read those books. I think it'd be great. Um, uh, Justin Toner says, Hey Rob, final count of my Criterion Collection purchases during the 50% off sale, 17. I had a movie night with friends on Thursday. We watched Faster Pussycat, Kill Kill, and Peter Jackson's Brain Dead Uncut. First time seeing them, enjoyed both movies. Well, it's your happening, and I'll bet it freaked you out. <laughs> I'm glad you watched um, Faster Pussycat Kill Kill. Um, we haven't watched Faster Pussycat Kill Kill uh, in whining about movies, but we could. We could. Uh, Bunyan Snipe is here. That image of Siegel and Schuster at the 1978 Superman premiere still brings a tear to my eye. Seeing their creation taken seriously must have given them a boost after decades of, frankly, shoddy treatment. I agree with you there. They certainly have not been treated very well. Uh, I'll, I'll need to look up that picture. Uh, that sounds like a picture I'd like to see. 
Um, Morality124 sends in a tip and says, I much prefer the idea of a Kirk-like character in the beginning than J.J. slapping Kirk's name with a completely different backstory, which should have produced a different person as per tapestry, but still ends up with the same fate due to destiny. I, I agree with you. I think Tiberius Chase is a really cool character. Um, but, you know, different. But but still, I, I really liked it. I mean, the script the script reads really, really well. It's a really well-written script. And as a former script reader, I've read hundreds and hundreds of scripts, thousands of scripts. It's a really great script. And while I would even uh, bolster its ties to, to canonical Star Trek, I said by adding Shran, give Shran more to do, and put in Jonathan Archer in it, I mean, I think it's great. I, I think it should get made. And Paramount owns it. Green light it. Let's go. Make this. Come on, man. Get on that stuff right now. Uh, why aren't you? Why aren't you making it? I mean, I definitely think it's it's something that that um, you know we should look into. Uh, Hunter uh, Hewitt, Hewitt, I think. Uh, Hunter says, Rob, I know you're sick and tired of movies being delayed, along with movies having their theatrical releases being canceled. I'm in the same boat with you. I say this because I work in a movie theater, <laughs> and I'm itching to get back there. Since Tenant is starting out in limited USA theaters Labor Day weekend, is there a good chance Warner Brothers might do the same same thing with Wonder Woman 1984? With A Quiet Place 2 and Top Gun Maverick being delayed until 2021, what are the chances that Black Widow might move into 2021 if movie theaters are not reopened by the time New Mutants is supposed to open? Hunter, I do not know. I mean, you know, L.A. death cases are spiking today. I... I, I <laughs> Who knows if we're going to get a handle on this? I don't know. You know, they open schools, kids come back exposed to COVID. And the viral load in kids is much higher than it is in adults. It's <laughs> I, I, it's not funny. I shouldn't be laughing, but I don't know what to tell you. It's, um, it's, uh, it's not good. Not good. Not good. Um. This, oh, I can't read this one yet because this is for whining about movies. You know what, I'm going to put this aside so I don't forget it. Um, so let's see who, who's next. Who's next do I have here? <laughs> this one, um, no, that, I've read that one already too. <sighs> Sorry. Sorry, everyone. Let's go back. This one comes from Tom Bidiscom. I think it's Bidiscom. Tom Bidiscom. Um, Hi, Rob. I have started watching the 1960s Batman series starring the great Adam West. We say a movie follows... Uh, we say a movie follow after the se oh we say that a movie follows and after the series finished it and it got me thinking is there any realm of possibility that we could see a live action film in the near future with a similar tone perhaps on a streaming service like HBO rather than a standard theatrical release we were treated to the animated return of the cape crusader with Adam West and Burt Ward returning to their respective characters and by the way Shatner was in the sequel Despite being a failure, Joe Schumacher's Batman Forever had a tone similar to the TV series, and although I would not see, not want to see it go completely in that direction, it would be interesting to see what a director could do. It does feel like a big ask, and with Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy with a more serious tone, it would seem the modern-day audience would find it hard to connect with such a contrast in tone. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I mean, I obviously grew up with the Batman series, and I... I loved it. I thought it was great, but I, I don't know if you could go back and do that. I I don't know, man. I don't think you could. I don't think audiences would dig it. I don't think they would hang with that. Um. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Robert, this one comes from William La Rochelle. I, you know what? I don't think you could. I, I just don't think people would accept it. I mean, again, you, that's why it worked as animation, the same way that like, Teen Titans Go works as a, in animation. I just don't think you could do it. Uh, William La Rochelle is here and says, Robert, have you had any occasion where you misheard a line of dialogue and just puzzled over it or let it go? My own examples would be that around the age of 9 or 10, I did not quite know the meaning of the word clone. So I thought Princess Leia said, years ago you served my father in the Cologne Wars, as in cologne that you wear. That's really funny. <laughs> 
Now I want to see somebody do a whole thing about the Cologne Wars. Are you wearing Dakar Noir? No, I'm wearing Obsession by Calvin Klein. <laughs> Let's fight. That'd be funny. Uh, when I saw Superman the movie, I did not know the word airs. I thought General Zod screamed at jor about getting revenge. First you, and then one day, your ass. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, I, I, uh, you know, I, I can't, um, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, it's not like, it's not like um, song lyrics. But excuse me while I kiss this guy. Uh, I, 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 I can't think of any movie dialogue that I was puzzling over. Um, I'm sure there's something. I just can't, I can't remember it right at this very moment. But that's, uh, that's funny. First you and then one day. <laughs> Especially if you add, you will bow down before me, jor <laughs> Both you and then one day, your ass. Ooh, that's a little creepy. <laughs> uh, I love that. Um, Eric Gant says, Stuck at work, but looking forward to watching the full show when I am off. Live long and prosper. Well, thank you, Eric. I hope you enjoy it. Brendan Sheehy sends in a super chat and says, You never hear people talk about Scorsese's after hours. It's a riot and shows Scorsese's delicious dark sense of humor. Why so little love? You know, I think it, it's kind of a forgotten movie. After Hours is so good. I think After Hours was the, the you know, that and Color of Money were the movies that brought Scorsese back, I think, into the public consciousness. I love After Hours. I think it's great. Really, really good film. It, and you're right, man. It doesn't get enough love. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I now bring Raw Observations episode number 480 to an end. I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, once again, I encourage everyone to go listen to Eric Jedrinson's interview on the Inglorious Trexperts today. So check that out wherever you get your podcasts. And by the way, the Inglorious Trexperts podcast, um, uh, it, it, uh, uh, it's pretty cool. I think you're really going to like it. If you like Star Trek, it's a terrific deep dive. A lot of celebrity guests. It's really a lot of fun. So check it out. Anyway, um, I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank you for supporting the channel via tips and super chats and uh, merch. People have been buying some merch lately. That's good. And I want to thank my moderating staff, beginning with the great Mike Bodden and Greg Smith. I want to thank Joshua Levesque. I want to thank Robert Preso. Uh, and I want to thank Robert Preso. I will, we will be reading your letter on whining about movies on Monday night. And, uh, uh, and of course, the Richard. And jump on over to the Facebook page, the Post Geek Singularity Facebook page, or the Whining About Movies Facebook page, and check out what the Richard's bringing you with his live streams. He's always doing something, watch parties, it's crazy, Zoom parties, he's, he's, it's a party over there all the time, so check that out. And if you want to send us letters, uh, the burnettwork.net website is ready to take your videos and your letters, and I will read them on the air. I still have some to get to. But I will be getting to those. So everybody, I want to thank you for joining me on this journey into the Star Trek The Beginning screenplay. And you know what? Hope Springs Eternal. CBS. Go make this movie. But make it with an independent production company. I mean, not an independent production company. Go find an auteurist director who really wants to make this movie um, uh, his own. I think it could be a great Star Trek story. And I, um, uh, yeah. So bring it on. And if you know if you guys want me to go into detail on the last latter half of Star Trek the beginning, I could do that. I mean I, I did I didn't want to spend more than an hour, but I, I gave you the setup and the premise, which is what I wanted to do. So the rest of it's all just great detail, but it's great stuff. Uh, John sends in a super chat and says, these screenplay readings that you specifically you do are very in entertaining. I think you should do these as a series. The problem is, Duel of the Fates, Dune, they block me, and who knows, maybe someone will block this show, but I doubt it. I don't even think Paramount or CBS knows about what this script even is. <laughs> I mean, maybe they do. Go find it in your archives. I mean, somebody c call, call Jim Giannopoulos. Come on, Jim. Go make Star Trek. Let Everybody should inundate Jim Giannopoulos' office. No, I'm just kidding. Don't, don't do that. Um, although, you know, if you do decide to do that, remember to write personal and confidential, write it definitely to Jim Giannopoulos, care of Paramount Pictures. It's going to go through their mail. 
but make it look as official as possible. Um, but write personal and confidential on the outside of the envelope. And be nice and make it short and to the point. Dear Mr. Giannopoulos, I strongly suggest you look into the 19, uh, pardon me, the 2005, the August 2005 draft, draft of um, Band of Brothers supervising producer Eric Jedrinson's Star Trek script, The Beginning. That should be the basis of a new trilogy of Star Trek theatrical release films. There you go. Done. Boom. Do that. Send it to him. Let's get it made, man. Let's get Star Trek The Beginning made because I think it would be great. Anyway, again, thanks very much to all of you. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I say, by the way, I'll be back here tomorrow, of course. I say, have a better day. Somebody asked me after, like, how long do we 